Yeah, uh, today I'm leading a journal club on this uh, on the Jeff Hinton paper on GLOM, uh, the, the um, neural system called GLOM. Uh, the paper is called How to Represent Part-Whole Hierarchies in a Neural Network. And uh, the, the agenda here is I'm, I'm focused on the parts of it that stand out when viewed through the lens of the thousand brains theory. And so, so the, this presentation has basically these, you know, these five bullet points that I'm organizing it into. Uh, first of all, I'm going to kind of bridge from our model to GLOM showing how it votes on objects at poses. Uh, that's kind of something we do in common or that versions of the thousand brains theory model has done. Uh, and then talking about how GLOM then does this thing where it puts multiple levels of part whole relationships in each of its so called cortical columns. It calls them hyper columns, but same thing. Uh, then I talk about how the voting is slightly different. I don't know if it contradicts exactly, but GLOM really emphasizes more voting doesn't all agree on one thing. It, it votes on uh, you know multiple islands of agreement. I'll show you visualizations of what I mean by that. The fourth point is going to be like some low level details where actually the neural representations that it uses are a lot more similar to ours. Uh, in our language, it would be it enables unions. Uh, their motivation is uh, representing uncertainty. So that's an interesting uh, transition, a different a difference from capsules. Uh, and finally, I'll talk about uh, glom and movement. Movement is not talked about in the paper, but I'm just saying like what the low hanging fruit is here. It will it work? Won't it work? That I'll. I'll bring up some discussion points on that. And uh, I'll say that, so there are other videos on YouTube about GLOM since we're posting this publicly, I thought I'd insert this blurb. Um, since I'm I'm presenting a thousand brain centric view of this, these other videos are good too. The, Jeff Hinton gave a talk and then also this one from Yannick Kilcher it was, is also really instructive. Also in the past, we have a history of talking about like relations between thousand brains theory and Hinton's work, both the his old, his 1981 papers he, he had many papers in 1981, and I reviewed them all in this presentation. And then we've also talked about capsules a couple of times, and a lot of the principles of capsules made it into GLOM. So just letting you know that there's this past discussion that's happened on this, though I won't assume you remember or, or, or saw it all. So uh, yeah, jumping in um, to, first of all, this is, this is the part where I'm going to talk about Thousand Brains a little bit, just to transition into GLOM. Uh, so GLOM's cortical columns, quote unquote, vote on object at pose. And so first of all, here's a thousand brains diagram, a subset of it. Uh, it's a subset of the diagram. Uh, there are some connections not shown here, but this is like as published in a couple of our papers. Uh, I'm showing three sensors. You, we often think of this as like three fingers. It could be three points on the retina. And um, and what these do is, first of all, they have a notion, we usually call it a location, but I'm adopting Hinton's language in this presentation. And that's what these slides are doing is introducing the terminology. Uh, we, you have some notion of location. I didn't bother labeling this layer, but it predicts your sensory input, uh, which feeds into a representation of what object you're sensing, which then can be voted on by multiple columns. So multiple sensors work together to vote on an object ID. Something we brought up a bunch of times over the years is that it's desirable if this vote can actually be on an object at a pose rather than just the ID. That just makes the system much more powerful and enables flash inference. You can have an image flashed on your retina and recognize it immediately without having to move around, or you can grasp an object and similarly recognize it immediately if you can vote on object at pose. And the way we've modeled this in the past was, uh, was using a slightly altered model of this uh, where what you have to have is you have to have some shared reference frame. Um, uh, the, so for example, you know, you have your sensors relative to your body, like your, like your hand, you're re reaching your hands around, you touch something. If you can move what you sense into a common reference frame and your body's reference frame, your arm's reference frame, some common frame, similar on retina, if it's relative to the full camera, um, then you can vote on an object that oppose and the one way we implemented this in the past, I'm not going to go into this visualization, but if you want to dive in and see this simulated, here's where we did this back in 2017. So just I'm, right now I'm getting you into this mindset of voting on an object at a pose, because uh, that's what GLOM does. Uh, so transitioning into GLOM here. Uh, I, go Marcus, on. Marcus, I hope yeah. you don't mind me interrupting. Yeah. So, um, 
I just want to make sure I, uh, some things you said, it was quick and I didn't follow all of it. Um, the way I thought, you know, as you point out in our papers, we talked about voting for objects, right? And then, and then we later said, no, it really, we're not really, that's not what it should be. It really should be object that pose, which is a different thing, right? That, that's saying what the object is and what its relationship. It's interesting. I don't remember, I, maybe it was in your simulations you did, but I don't remember that you had to have a common reference frame to, to vote on object that pose. Um, I, I, and you said that. Um, but uh, that might have been the, that, was that the quote unquote claustrum thing? Yeah, Marcus? it was. Oh, 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 that part. Yes. Okay. That makes sense to me. Yeah, um, that's what, that's that what, was, that was the quote unquote claustrum thing. In this okay, picture, okay. I said, I yeah. put this in the claustrum because I didn't want to. Got it. Yeah. Anyway, right. that's where I put it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yes. Okay. But that wasn't in a, that we didn't see that that was proposed to be in a separate place as opposed to in each column. In some sense. Correct. Yeah. In this visualization, I could have like moved this down and had been like some other layer. I could have called yeah. it a different population, but here I decided to make it a little bit more like glam. Yeah. yeah. We did talk about doing it possibly like this. Um, yeah. as, as Hinton discusses in his glom paper, like one of the things he's, he described is why he didn't only do one population, why he replicated this multiple times. I, I don't know, I'm not presenting very well because I never introduced this visualization, but the point yeah. is, yes, you're right. I did do a little hand waving here. That's why you're confused. Uh, okay, yeah. I mean, I think we haven't really worked through, I mean, you've done more of it than anyone else, but I don't think we've ever really worked through, um, at least I haven't worked through uh, the whole, the implications for voting on pose, um, uh, you know, it's it's it's. I, I agree that we, it, it's happening, but it's it's always been a bit confusing to me. So, but you you simulated it to some extent. Okay, I have a question from this. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, so, the question I have is uh, on that top level where you show intercommunication on that uh, level. Is there any sense of what the level of connectivity is? I mean, you're, you you schematic, you know, you know, just you know, single connection across the columns. But I'm assuming that it's a it's a two D set of connections. Is there any constraints he uh, provides on that degree of interconnectivity? Okay, uh, and and his the, they're vectors that are quote unquote identical. They're the same population vectors. Um, the, so it's it's I'm big populations of cells that have the same activation. Then he goes into a later biologically plausible section where he talks about how you could get something that's a little more realistic. So he does. So he the way they do it in Glom is literally have it be the same vector, the same you know 1,024 bits, let's say, uh, and the, the same one is going to vote for the same one. So we, I we see. Don't have so that, that double sided arrow is just a. Uh, 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 is is actually not what's occurring. They're all feeding into the same block. No, no. I think what Marcus no, is no. he's showing the thousand brains version of this, where we do have separate uh, populations of vectors, and the lateral back and forth communication is actual connectivity. Um, so in the thousand brains, each cortical column has its own population. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and Glam does as well. And Glam each I, will have its own population. But but they're but they're the identical in Glam, right? Um, yes. Copies. So I, I thought Kevin might you might have been asking a different question about the nature of those connections. Um, um, well, that, that's why I was I was yeah I mean if if they're actually separate but communicating with each other to what what is the the the, uh, the connectivity among the uh, columns is just the in, adjacent in, ones or no 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 it could be it, it could be these are uh, medium and long range connections in the cortex so. Um, you know, if you look at connections between the, the, the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain, well, you see a lot of connections between the, the parts of the somatocentric cortex that represent the left hand and the parts that represent the right hand. So in theory, I mean, that would, we would say that's because often the left and the right hand are touching the same thing and they have, it's fruitful for them to vote. Um, and so any, any part of the cortex that could fruitfully vote, you might have connections. The, the other interesting thing about these connections and I've mentioned this a few times, but I don't think we've ever really tested this. Maybe we have, I don't remember. But you don't need as many as you think you need. <laughs> that is, um, if I was a single column, and I need to, I need to be able to, uh, we're voting on something, I maybe need to get 100 connections to vote you know, from someplace else. 
those hundred connections could be could be randomly distributed among hundred different columns. Uh, that is, uh, every column doesn't have to be very much connected to every other column. It, it's as long as I just have a sufficient number of. Um, I, I can't prove this right now, but I'm, I'm sure it's true. I'm pretty sure it's true um, that that the, the the density of these connections can be much sparser than you might imagine initially. As long as each column has enough bits coming into from someplace else, uh, the whole system will settle. Um, so, uh, but so you, you would see these going in locally. You'd see them within a within a region. You'd see them between regions that are adjacent to each other. You might see them across the cortex, you know, different sides, the corpus callosum. So, um, but do we have a characterization of that? Is like a is a, is like a small world network or something, or do we just? Uh, don't know? Uh, I don't know enough. About, I know that these these maps, these connections have been shown to exist, but I don't know if numerically they're well understood. Okay. Is this notion um, so, of sorry, it's a <laughs> That's okay. Uh, just to make I make sure I understand here kind of one big difference when we have in the thousand brains theory, the, the top population was stable for an object regardless of the pose. Right. So it was kind of an invariant representation right. of an object. Here, when we have an object that pose, that representation is obviously changing as the pose changes. Correct. Um, right, and so you don't necessarily have a stable representation of an object, uh, but you might have. I guess he's used the term. Well, it would, it would be stable if the pose. It'd be stable as the pose is stable, right? Um, yeah, but if the if the object changes its rotation or yeah. changes its pose relative to you, all of those vectors yeah. I'm assuming. So that's change. that's always the that's the thing I was saying. I haven't really kind of worked this out in my head. Maybe Marcus, you've done. I don't know where. I still know the identity of the object, although the pose has changed. One way, to, one way to think, I think the one way I think about it is that we're only perceptually aware of these voting neurons, and so what you perceive, what am I? You know, I'm looking right now. I see my computer in front of me. It's not, you know, my eyes are moving, but the computer doesn't seem to be moving. And so, but I perceive the computer as being its own pose to me. I, I don't just say computer. It's a, oh, it's my computer at some particular position and orientation to me. And that is the thing I'm perceiving. So that is, a, those are going to be voting neurons that represent that. Yet at the same time, I do know it's my computer. It's not just like, uh, it's not unique from my computer at other positions. So there's, there's you know, somehow we are able to extract out the, the computerness from the computer at, at a particular pose. Um, but anyway, I do think, I think that's one way to look at it. What, what are you perceptually aware um, of? And that's, that's, I believe, what you're going to be seeing the voting. I don't know if Lucas had something. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Uh, I, I'm just skimming the paper. Uh, there is this notion of uh, connections, I think, between parts, something like that. Yeah. So is it is sparsity, as, as Jeff's explaining, that uh, he feels that you only need some of the connections. And since you know there, uh, you only need some of the connections to make sure uh, they are all connected to each other. So is that notion of sparsity in this paper as well? or are all this connectivity dense? A different form of sparsity is there. Uh, when I talk about islands, and then the next slide, a couple of slides, I'll I'll talk about where Hinton calls out something like that, where the number of horizontal connections will uh, can be limited for a, a different reason, though. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, so the point of this slide was to a get you in the mindset of voting on objects it poses and B, to introduce Hinton's, Hinton's terminology. We use the word location quite often, uh, and sometimes we use the word pose. Hinton uses the word pose when in, all, in most of the places we talk about any of those things. When Hinton talks about location, he's talking about where the sensor is. Like for example, where my hand is relative to my body, where a part of the retina is relative to the array of sensors in general. You could talk about a lot of those, but when Hinton talks about locations, that's what he's talking about. And so one so of the, one, on. Just to be clear, one of the reasons we talk about location a lot is that um, if you think about grid cells, they don't seem to represent pose, right? They seem to represent location. They're, they seem to be like, hey, you know, here's where the animal is. It doesn't matter which way his orientation is at that, you know. And so biology seems to have this representation of location independent of pose. And then it has so, a separate representation of pose, which is the orientation cells, the hedgehogs. 
So, okay, pose here includes location and orientation. Yeah, I understand that. I'm just and, saying that. Um, so, so, so what you're saying, um, it, this contorts language a little bit, but you could say that grid cells and head direction cells represent the environment's pose, the yes. environment at a pose. Yes. I agree with that, but my point is there are two separate pop. The way we think, typically think of them is there are two separate populations of cells. They're not a single population of cells. Yes, a pose is two populations typically. So, but but okay, but so the way we look at your object of pose or voting, well, the, that implies in this picture that it's like one population is voting. And this is the thing that's always confused me about this. If we can say that oh, there's two populations that are voting, orientation and and location, that makes it easier for me to, to think about it. So is that what you think? Is that the way to write that way to think about it? Then there is no, there are That's no. That's a valid way. Okay. It's, it's a valid way, but um, but as I'll say in a few slides, um, Hinton is very flexible with these cells, really like intermixing, being sort of locationy, sort of orientationy, sort of ID like. Like he he lets them take whatever meaning they want to. I'll talk about that in a few slides as well. But from a biology point of view, if uh, I, again we haven't really, I haven't really thought enough about this, but. From a biological point of view, if I could say, oh, well, pose is just going to be represented by two populations, orientation cells and location and grid like cells, and um, that makes it easier for me to think about it. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, that, that works as like an intuitive. Okay, so you don't think that's, you think that's a valid way of thinking about it? It's valid, yeah. <clears throat> okay, that makes it easier. Uh, so, one, one last thing relating the two in the voting. Um, on the left, I'm going to, I'm showing, like what happens at one level of GLOM roughly, uh, the, this is just bridging the gap. I had to contort this a little bit to make this point, but, um, but at its core, it's taking sensory input and the location of the sensor in a shared reference frame. Um, the, it's most common one it uses is simply where on the retina is this, um, this pixel basically, but, it, but it, this techniques will also work with the you know, location of finger relative to hand, et cetera. Uh, and from that, it passes it through a trained neural network, maybe a number of layers deep. Like it's, it's they're pretty flexible to how deep this is, uh, and and it outputs an object at a pose. A and bringing in our model on the right here, um, ours takes sensory input, figures out object at pose relative to sensor, and then takes this location input and puts it into a shared reference frame. And just to be cute, I made them vote together, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, the, the statement I'm making here is that like uh, from a high level, like from afar, you can look at this alternative version of the 3000 brains model, because as Supatai pointed out, we usually vote on identity. Uh, so I'm going to always call this the alternate version, the one that's voting on an object that oppose. Um, you, you can look at it as like what we're doing at a single level is a highly specified version of what the GLOM network's doing at a single level. It's leaving it open to just train how whatever it wants, uh, where ours in, in principle, it could train this network. It, it, if you train this, it could land on this. Uh, and so, so there's this like similarity here where ours is just more highly specified. Um, this is the end of this section. The next is actually gonna be you know, more fun and talking about GLOM itself and the, and the diagram of the diagram that will appear in any GLOM presentation. So I'm gonna cover two points here, part, parts two and three of five. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about how GLOM includes multiple levels of part whole relationships in each cortical column or hyper column. And, uh, and I'm going to also talk about how the voting in GLOM doesn't all try to settle on one thing, at least not on the um, not on most of the levels. It tries to, uh, it, it'll be better with a picture, which is in the next slide. It creates these islands of agreement. Um, so this is a central figure from the paper. And, um, you don't necessarily need to read the, the caption, but I put it here in case there's any confusion. Uh, this is showing um, five different populations uh, across across six different columns, and it hierarchically goes up. These vectors here, he just draws these simple 2D vectors, but it's, it's actually a stand-in for a high-dimensional population. I'm just making up a number, maybe a thousand cells each. I'm just making that up though. And, and within the so-called column, uh, as you go up it, you arrange these low level parts into subparts, into parts, into objects, and, and what he calls the scene level embedding at the top. 
And as you go up, it they 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 agree more and more until they are agreeing on a single until they are voting on a single thing typically. Uh, but in the intermediate steps, which are all voting horizontally at their at their particular level, uh, it kind of by design creates these islands, these islands of agreement where these three columns will agree on this level, these three columns will agree on this level. And then on the next level, they um, they all six agree. I'll throw in a terminology point here. We usually use the word level totally differently from this. Uh, often when you, we use the word level, we're talking about hierarchy. He's using it as something that's like inside the column. It's more of the conceptual level of parts and holes. Uh, so I made my point, basically the two, the two points I'm getting across here, uh, are it's, it's this five level. He chose five because it just seems realistic from what we're capable of doing. Uh, like if you like psychologically and, uh, the, the five levels in, in one column with voting at every single one of those levels, all, all resolving into a, uh, a coherent scene level, um, vector at the top. Uh, this is a, um, it's a recurrent network where it's processing input over time and every level is receiving input from the bottom, the, from above it, below it, and from the side. And all just, it's, the system's trying to resolve. It's, it's, it's very much like a voting system where it's also receiving input from the bottom and from the bottom and top. Uh, it's hard for me to gauge how long I should spend talking about this slide. Well, I, it, I, yeah. It's a simple system once it's in your head and that it's hard for me to remember what it's like not to understand it. So feel free to ask questions. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand it. Okay. <laughs> I, I have an observation which might help you understand it. So, and and I, Mark, is you correct if, if I think my observation is correct? So I, I read through the paper, through this part at least. I didn't read the whole paper, but. So, but but he's he's doing something fundamentally different than the way we think about the thousand brain theory. Um, he's trying to take an image and process it without movement. That is, you're you're taking you're taking a parallel picture and you're processing the entire picture, and he's trying to figure out where are the subcomponents of this picture and where they are relative to other subcomponents of this picture, and he's doing that in parallel without any movement of the sensor. And this figure re reflects that. This figure says, oh, in one part of the image, the, we can, these columns on the left here can blue, we agree on the blue thing. That's a, you know, some, some part of the image. And then when I go up to the third level, well, slightly larger part with the red arrows, oh, yeah, now there's more columns that are agreeing on that, that the, the blue and the yellow were part of a red, red thing, and so on. We're in the thousand brains, or at least I know in brains, not just the thousand brain theory, but in brains, what the difference is, is that, we attend to parts of the image and our eyes are moving and attending to one part to the next part to the next part. And each attention, each movement of the eye is we then figure out the, the relative positions of the thing that was attended to at that moment. So in the brain, you would build up this hierarchical composition through movement. You would do one piece at a time, just like walking through your house, you build up one room at a time, but you do this as you move, as you look at a physical image, you wouldn't process a whole image at once, you'd say, oh, there's a boat, and there's a person, and there's a shore, and there's a kite. And then each time you do that, you figure out where they are relative to the other things you just saw. And he's trying to do here all at once. And so he has to assume that the columns that are representing different parts of the image have to, you know, oh, the upper left corner of the image is going to be one thing, and the bottom right corner of the image is another thing. And that's where you might see the red and the green arrows here. They're like saying, oh, we're, we, we see a boat in the bottom right, and we see a, a person on the upper left. But that's all happening in parallel, uh, as opposed to any kind of movement. Thing. I don't know if that helps with your confusion about this, but that's I, that's my interpretation of this. Is that yeah, like that, you that's all correct? Okay. One thing I just wanted to clarify. So yeah, I unfortunately I only had the chance to look briefly at the actual paper, but in terms of um, how the representations are being transformed from each level of this hierarchy to the next. I think he mentions at the start that he uses a kind of an autoencoder in, in his kind of original interpretation. I was just wondering exactly, as in, is it, um, is the idea that the kind of low level representation is being taken to uh, a kind of 
through potentially multiple levels in a neural network uh, to some hidden representation. And then, um, which is in, in his view is, is lower dimensional or, or how is, I don't know. Yeah. Does he get concrete about how that's um, implemented? So, uh, well, just first little note, just detail that I didn't mention. Um, the the connections from here to here, from from one level to the next, and also from the the top down level, each of those has a mini deep network involved. I, it's it's unspecified how many layers it's going to be. So it's gonna it's gonna be like right. a little feed forward network from here to here, a little feed forward network from here to here, and the one going down. I'll show a figure, but all, that's also where it takes in the location input. Uh, for yeah, for training it, I'm, let's see. I can only give a partial answer to this. I haven't been thinking about the training aspect of this that much. It's unsupervised. It is doing contrastive learning. It's doing the kind of thing. It's it's like um, it's like um, come on, uh, the self-supervised learning where it, it will like take out a patch of the image and then it has to fill it in. It's that style of training that the network has to do as a whole. Okay. Uh, to to the point that uh, Neil's raised, uh, he doesn't specify how many levels are, but is it is it is it compressive in the in the same way that an autoencoder would be, or it's just arbitrary? I missed a word in there. Is it what in a way autoencoder would be in, in the way uh, compressive? Um, you know, it's going through a, a sparse representation, then expanding out uh, to something else. I, I think by de by definition it must be just because this is going to be a smaller vector, uh, but that's my best answer I can give. Okay. Yeah, that um, helps. Thanks. Yeah, I still have some sort of basic confusion about kind of what these boxes are and okay. and, and, and cortical columns and and. So so you mentioned that when he says level, it's not levels of the hierarchy. Yeah. Um, is each box here one level? One one of these boxes here is that one level? Yes. Uh, because this, if you go up here, this is like the traditional hierarchy. Um, you know, going from low level features all the way up to objects and scenes. Um, that that mm -hmm. seems like a very much a traditional hierarchy to me. And so, yeah. uh, but then I'm very confused about what is a column. Is this entire thing a column? Um, In his terminology, there, yes. Yeah, a I, column. Uh, is Never. there is there then a hierarchy of columns, or is that uh, he doesn't when, make when a we think about it? No, you don't talk okay. about that. Remember, in this case, the columns are associated with a um, a physical part of an image. And again, because there's no movement involved, the leftmost column is always going to be associated with some uh, multiple scales. Black being the smallest scale, blue the larger, larger, and so on. But it's always associated. Like, imagine you just got a picture as a two-dimensional image, and that column is always focused on one part of that image. And you might think that's like the brain, but it's not because the brain's eyes are moving all the time. So, um, it, it, yeah, and the brain's cortical columns are nothing like this. Um, yes, no, they're nothing like this. At you all. know, they're, they're um, uh, here. I should I should throw on the next slide here, then we can continue this just in case. So I consider both possibilities here. One is if it is all in one column. First image that came to mind is this idea of if you look at cells and the cortex, as you go through the layer depth, you get more complexity going up or and they get larger. So it's it's evocative of that. On the other hand, I give what, what Subita just said, I am taking his use of the word hypercolumn literally. This system really could work as a model of V1, V2, V4, IT. Uh, uh, so I think this bottom point is a little bit what Subita was saying. But yeah, but not that's not a, a hypercolumn doesn't cross v1 v2 v4 it like i know that. that that's that's why my that's why i said like that's why i disclaim this maybe i'm wrong to take him literally yeah. maybe I, well, he's using column to mean something totally different i i don't know i haven't talked yeah, about this but his his use of these terms suggests to me that he he he's just using very very um uh, casually related to biology there, it's it's not like there's a he's thought about it much of, it doesn't seem like he's thought much about the biological aspects of this at all. Um, he says, hey, yeah, people talk about columns. I call this a column too, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, as opposed to the kind of questions you're asking. To me. I don't think, it just doesn't seem like he's thinking about this stuff, or maybe he doesn't even know it. I don't know. 
I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I know I, he, I think... he has a he has a strong uh, psychology background when it comes to vision. I don't know. I don't know if he comes in with a strong. But but even just the way he's hand, I mean, this system that he's proposed, uh, it couldn't possibly work for touch, for example, or for hearing, um, because you don't have this sort of uh, regular mapping idea that you have like a picture, you know, that you're processing. Um, where columns are always in the same location in that picture. You know, what does that mean in a touch where fingers are moving and body parts are moving? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so again, I think it's, I think it comes out from the computer vision perspective, maybe some psychology, but I, I basically have interpreted his, his use of these words, column, hypercolumn, all this stuff is very, very loose and more confusing for the people like us who know exactly what these things mean. Because um, I don't think they really have a correspondence. Yeah, I, I think it's sort of close to what Jeff, you were saying earlier, like maybe if you have an image at each location in the image, you have an entire hierarchy um, where you go from low level features all the way up to scenes. And that's what he's calling a column. Yes. And you have one of these at every location. And then they're all sort of voting laterally. Yeah, um, and there's no, and there's no, know, I, and there's no idea. Has, of phobia or yeah, so like that, the column know? is really the hierarchy. So I, I think he is using the word level to mean level in a hierarchy. Um, but he's that, also, he's saying that there's this processing that goes on in a, um, a column. I don't know. I, okay. He calls them columns. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, if you look at it. Yeah, classic, it's just that instead of thinking of a classic column, convolutional neural that's... network. If you look at a classic convolutional neural network, no one. I don't think anyone says, here's this unit that spans all the layers. It's only over this side of the image. I mean. You, yeah, you could construct one by looking at the different layers, but um, but no one called that a column, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think he's calling it a column. <laughs> it's sort of column because it's vertical. <laughs> so, so, yeah, and he has a lot, and he's showing a cortical column. He's just sort of breaking it down into like these 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 networks that Marcus was talking about these communications between the levels in a column. And then there's voting across columns where we would say, oh, you have a network, you have a large neural network and there's some sort of operation that goes in one layer and then we go up to the next one. There's some sort of operation that goes on there. I mean, it's just sort of parsing it differently. Um, I don't know why he calls them columns, but that's what he does. So coming back to that interpretation of where it is a hierarchy, it is V1, V2, V4, IT, for example. Um, I just want to come well, back. Well, I, I, I think I would hesitate to say V1, V2, V4, IT. I, we, I think we could say it's a hierarchy. It's sure. a slice. I think it's, it's a difficult slice to of, map, map it's it to those, V1, to those cortical areas. It's a piece of V1 and a piece of V2 and a piece of V4 and a piece of IT yeah. that are stacked on top of one. Uh, but only sort of. That, yeah, but I think that's a very loose. I, I, I think it's, I think trying to map it to the neuroscience is going to be really hard. No, uh, I, I at agree. Least so far as I could think, yeah. Yeah, I'm, it, it's I really a concept. It's a conceptual model. It's not really designed to be a biological model. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah, and he 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 makes that point too. I, mean, I think he does. But but anyway, the point he does use the word column and hypercolumns, but that's confusing. <laughs> so. So coming back, I want to just once again bring up the island point. Uh, it, take that hierarchical view. Say that maybe this one that with the blue and the pink is B one. Uh, the what this model does by it does intentionally is it has like your visual field represent different islands of so-called objects and so that's we don't explicitly not do that but more often when we talk about it we talk about everything voting together and agreeing on one thing and well i would say yeah, but, would, but, but that is but that, that's hour. typically a, that, that's a traditional hierarchical view of visual processing this is you will get these islands, um, even in a traditional feed forward hierarchy without lateral connections. Um, you know, just because there's convergence, you will, you'll literally get these, these types of levels and you'll get one part of it talking about the boat and the other part of it kind of representing the forest or, what, or, or the, <laughs> you know, the mountains or whatever. You, you'll, you'll get these quote unquote islands. Um, and I think, Marcus, you're, you're, he has a more, probably he has a much more specific definition of islands than, um, than what we've kind of mentioned so far. And, and maybe we should go to the implementation at some point. But to me, this looks very much like a traditional hierarchy um, here. But isn't there a difference here that 
uh, the post convolution, now you have these columns at each uh, patch of the image. So uh, yeah, you have object level embeddings for each uh, pose, uh, the pose and for each patch of the image. I don't know how he calls that. Yeah. Isn't this different than convolution than the traditional? I didn't, say anything, I didn't say anything about convolution. Convolution is just a pure kind of speed up thing. And, uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an optimization hack. Uh, but if you think about the conceptual view of a hierarchy, it's not that different from what we've seen so far here. Uh, but what I meant in convolution is that this traditional hierarchy, you keep uh, you keep processing like small parts until you get to this overall object level embedding for the whole image. Whereas here you mm -hmm. have that for each patch of the image. So you have multiple- No, 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 no. At the, at the top, you get a single object level embedding. That's what all the black arrows are. It's a single, it's a single that's what scene. you get in a traditional hierarchy. You, you, you have a bunch of replications of that, of of that. So you have many populations of cells all, all agreeing, agreeing on the same one, and that, yeah. all copying it. Yeah. So it's that is yeah. a difference. I mean, that, that is that, that is a difference. Uh, I, I'm just saying that the, you know each each of these squares to me seems like a level of a hierarchy. And yes, they're separated. Maybe they're not converging into a single population like you just mentioned, but it's still levels of a hierarchy. Okay, I mean, I can I, I can see calling it that. I'm not sure what difference it makes. I mean, it's it's just confusing. Well, the difference is it's not like this is one what we think of a cortical column, and then there'll be another cortical column stacked on top of this. No, no, I we don't think this is. I mean, right? This, this is it. This this, this is, is the whole yeah, system. There there is no cortical. This is totally different idea of a cortical column. Right. Yeah. This yeah. Exactly. That's all. that's that's my point. Yeah. yeah. I think I think I would agree with that. This is not like a biological cortical column, and it's. Uh, I mean, Marcus, you point out there is some, you know, scale difference within upper and lower layers, but I, I have a totally different interpretation for that. So, um, to, to I think it, what I would say, is, yeah, this is this is not like our cortical columns at all. This is a, a, another thing he calls an abstract concept and calls it a column. <laughs> you know, not, I'm not sure if he's trying to get some cred from the biological world by calling it a column or not, but I don't know. But but it's not like a cortical. So my reason for coming back to this slide was I wanted to bring up voting horizontally and say, and I just, the discussion topic here is in thousand brains, do you see it as uh, having these islands or do you see it as everything uh, voting on one thing? As you look around, as you look at an object, does, does your entire sheet of uh, your entire sensory well, array- The way I've been thinking about it is that is that you, with each attention, you narrow down your attentional field until you are able to recognize it as one thing, right? And so I could may say, oh, uh, I can recognize this bicycle as one thing. It's occupying this percent of my visual field and I, that's good enough. If I didn't know what a bicycle was, uh, then I wouldn't be able to recognize it as one thing. And then I would narrow my attention down to, oh, there's a wheel and there's a pedal and there's a handlebar. I know what those things are. And, I was, and so it's like, um, you only you vote on one you, everything is voting at one thing at a time and you're doing it sequentially the extent of the receptive field that's involved changes depending on what you can recognize as one thing um, but to me it's not you're not building these things up simultaneously nowhere do I, I, do, I, do I do I think the voting neurons um, now I'll have to be careful I don't say nowhere there's a lot we still don't know but in general I think um, you think it is okay we're all going to vote on th this is a bicycle okay now here's a person and here's a, and, and here's a tree and we now know where they are relative to each other because i i, but I attended i moved my eyes to cut it and attended to each one each time one at a time so you wouldn't be voting multiple things at once like this okay yeah i was trying to get your, your current sense on that so that that's my current sense there is some weirdness about it because like what if you know we talked about v1 what if what if the thing you're looking at is so large scale that V1 really can't contribute as much as we'd like? Uh, you know, we do know that the retina projects to V2 and to V4 as well. And so what is V1 doing if I'm looking at something very large um, that, um, that is suitable for V2 or V4, but not, you know, like what is, v, what is V1 processing at that point? Is it, is, it, is it on its own voting on smaller pieces? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't, I haven't looked at it. Okay, uh, I'm, I'll jump into the next section that's a little bit more low level. Okay. Okay. Can What's I have up? a quick, more machine learning question, switching the gears okay. a little bit. So 
you mentioned recurrent connections between the levels at some point. Uh, so this, I'm implying there is some notion of time step or cycles here. And that is true also for inference time. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Okay, and then do you backpropagate through time as well? To backpropagate through the whole uh, recurrent connections? Yes. Okay, all right. Uh, so uh, part four, where, uh, where capsules use scalars, uh, GLOM uses population vectors that are more similar to our types of neural representations. Uh, so on the left here, uh, in the, we've talked about capsules in the past. Here I've drawn these little circles to indicate how capsules use cells, use, use units. Um, and they, they'll literally use them as, um, as uh, as parts of a matrix, like filling in this matrix. If you fill in these 12 numbers, you can represent any pose. Um, and in fact, or, or you can reduce that down to six because they're really only six dimensions of pose in 3D. Uh, and so, so capsules kind of abstracted away the neural hardware and just allowed these so-called cells, these units, these numbers to be trained by backprop and to just do matrix multiplications. And GLOM interestingly gets away from that. It it it, it abandons that. Uh, so in GLOM, uh, units are points in the full configuration space. Uh, the full um, the full set of axes like x, y, z, theta, psi, phi. Um, it's like it distributes the cells throughout that, and. Um, and it's it, so it's it's quite similar to an attractor sheet where and where a two D version of that if you're representing location there are two ways to do this the capsule way of doing representing a two D location would be you have an X cell and a Sorry, Y cell <laughs> Siri uh, um, you have an X cell and a Y cell uh, and in the GLOM way is more of like the two D attractor sheet way where you have a bunch of a sheet of cells that just represent different two D locations. Uh, they they've moved in this direction um, to so so the general the general view of it is you take all your degrees of freedom, you know, distribute your cells throughout it conceptually, um, and and that is how you represent things rather than representing the values of the different axes, you represent a bump of activity somewhere in this space. Yeah, it's interesting in the original capsules talk that Hinton did, he actually talked about the right hand way of doing it. Um, and it's it comes from an old technique called Huff, Huff transforms, um, where which are basically exactly that it, you represent points in configuration space, and then you you accumulate votes for the different areas of configuration space. Um, and he he mentioned that in his first talk. So uh, I think the original implementation of capsules had the thing on the left because I probably couldn't figure out exactly how to do the Huff transform way on the right. But um, it's good that he's got gotten back to gotten back to that view it's much more general purpose and much more powerful yeah so the so the motivation for it is distributing the cells through this configuration space enables yeah. representing yeah. uncertainty or ambiguity so here i'm showing a union basically a union of two possible locations and orientations for example uh yeah and, or like a location on a specific object versus a location on another specific object um, and again, this is similar to how an attractor sheet can represent multiple locations simultaneously, whereas X, Y coordinates can't. Um, but as Subutai just mentioned, the downside is coordinate transformations are now more difficult in the system. Uh, we face the same issue. When you, when you represent these axes directly, it's just a set of scalar multiplications or dot products to perform a coordinate transformation. When you do it in more of this population distributed throughout the space of the space of all of these axes, uh, it's now more of a like brute force. It's it's harder. It's it's no longer a trivial a trivial cheap operation, and so they're gonna he, he's gonna face the same issue, and he, he disclaims that in the paper that that is a thing that's gonna be harder. I guess yeah, this might help with one thing I was concerned about was how because I guess one of the original kind of really appealing things about capsules was how kind of moving them away from this sort of bag of features type processing that things like CNNs do to, to actually respect the, the relative uh, locations of features when, when doing something like uh, recognizing an object. But, um, but it wasn't clear to me how, 
how Glom uh, deals with this, uh, or, or like if that's specified. But but is that kind of what you're getting at here? That that essentially that's that's left as an open uh, question. Well, it's it's the thing that he that he, he explicitly wants to work. Like it, it's it's going to be this feeding into a right. multi-layer perceptron of some kind into the next level and that that multi-layer perceptron needs to perform a coordinate transformation on this somehow and right. part of it's going to happen through like here i've distributed the, this evenly through the three degrees of freedom but the system if it wants to it could it could throw a few of them off to just be head direction cells or, or orientation cells like it, it can choose to divide them up if the back prop says that's what it should do and but in general, he's kind of trusting the black box to work and um, and find a way to perform these coordinate transformations that will then work across objects that will, that will work not just for think, one object. But if I'm one. understanding all this, I think if you know, we propose this idea that coordinate transforms are happening in the and the uh, visuals. And what they're doing there is you're doing the coordinate transforms on a um, Jeff, your um, audio is uh, uh, difficult. I don't know if it's coming from your microphone or from some other. Is it better now? Yeah, much better, much better. Okay, my my, my microphone got unplugged a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, what I was going to say is, you know, I proposed this method for doing uh, coordinate transforms using the thalamus, and that what you're doing there is you're, you're you're sort of going back to the old way. It's not X, Y, and Z, but it's a a, a set of you know, over complete set of of dimensions, and you can transform. You can do a transformation on each single one dimensional vector independently of the others, and so you have the benefit of doing this coordinate transform. But um, it's sort of in the old way, like X Y Z way. But then you still. But then you trans. Then it gets. It, so if, as long as you as long as you're doing the transformations via movement or a movement vector is involved, it, I think you can have the best of both worlds. I think you can have like the easy transformation or into transformation and you still get the, the, the internal representation that is not like that. You can get unions or things like that. I, I, I'm sorry, the other way, I'm not saying it very well, but I think you can have the best of both worlds. And I think the, the method that uh, I've been proposing to the Thomas would let you do that. Um, it's just more, I'm, I'm thinking out loud as much as anything. I didn't understand this part of this paper. I didn't get to this part. It's good. I mean, one possible thing here, what I don't know if he mentioned in his paper, is you could take the point of configuration space that has the most votes, attend to that. And at that point, you can do all your transformations with respect to that point. Um, you know, like if you want to move to a particular point, you can just pick the point here which has the most votes, and then now you can. Do whatever you need to. Now you can do the previous method. But, but isn't right? the point of the can... isn't the point of the transformations are like you have these black circles here, um, and you, what you want to do is you want to just like say you know just transform all. Imagine if the reference frame rotated or or, or something like that, and you now you want to know where they are in the new reference frame. Is that right? Um, that's what we're talking about here, right? When the transformations. I, I come. Y yes. Yes. Okay, so I don't think you need to do the attentional thing. I think you could update them all at once. I think as, as long as you, the, the, the transformations, it, if you think about, if the transformations are going through the thalamus, you basically do the transformations in the 1D um, vectors of space um, and, and then the blobs would follow. <laughs> I'll just have to leave it at that. I think you can make this all work even without attention. I think, I think it, I'd have to think about it more, but it strikes me that. You could have both the best of both worlds. You don't. You never get back to this origin point or having a need, needing to know a particular reference uh, point. Um, I mean, do you think could you handle unions that way? I, I I don't see why at the moment, and I haven't thought I haven't worked too carefully to say. I don't see why you couldn't update all the unions the union simultaneously. It's not, it's not clear to me right now why you couldn't do that. Yeah, it might be if it's in one D, it becomes much more tractable. Yeah, again, you're you're doing the transformations in these one D things. It's just like you know, the, think about the the voltage control oscillators in the grid cells. Right, they represent you know movement in one direction. So then we, had, but then you translate it into um, 
you know, later you end up with, you know, with grid cells and place cells. I mean, I, I, I want to shut up because I, I haven't thought through this enough. Uh, I, I think you could, I, it's, I, I'll just say it again. At the moment, I don't see why I couldn't get <laughs> the best of both worlds. As long as you, as long as you do your transformations in the way I've talked about, um, the coordinate transformation. All right, that just needs to be thought more. I'm gonna shut my mouth. Yeah, there's a chance if if Hinton's right that a feed forward network can take this and and perform a coordinate transformation on it. If it works on one, it might work on a union just as is through magic. Yeah. But that's hand wave. Uh, but I thought it's possible. That's gonna. I thought that was one of the weaker aspects of the paper. Where he just kind of relied on, you know, classic neural networks to solve all these different problems. You know, we'll stick another one here. We'll stick another one here. You haven't showed the diagram yet with his, you know, his time diagram with the three right. levels. Um, you know, every one of them, he, he throws in like every every time anything has to happen. There's a, you know, oh, stick in a multi-layer neural network here. Uh, it's like this. They end up with hundreds or thousands of them, you know, all over the place. Uh, but I, I, because I, we know that the brain doesn't do that. The brain has specific mechanisms. Grid cells are a specific mechanism. You know, they work under very specific terms and, and head direction cells and so on. So it's, you know, I think he's, he, I think we know that at least in the brain, it's not solved that way. Uh, can a neural network do all these things? Could it learn it? Maybe. I don't know. But I know, I know biology doesn't do it that way. So it's probably not, probably not the way we want to do it in the future. But maybe I'm wrong about it. When you say like stick a neural network here, does it mean like stick a function approximator or is there anything particular about neural networks for this uh, problems that you mentioned? You're correct, yes. Uh, fun a function approximator in general and the default is yes, a, ne a, a small neural network. What you mean by function approximator is like any function I need just use a neural network for it? Is that what you're saying? Does yeah, I mean, you, yeah. you could, instead of a neural network, you could put like any sort of model that could learn that function. Yeah. And it's not that he specifies the function. He says, you know, at least in some cases, he just says, yeah, well, something has to happen here. And, you know, <laughs> so we'll throw it in the neural network and I'll make it happen. I mean, it could actually work because neural network is so powerful, but we know that the brain doesn't do it that way. So that's just, that's but I think you'll have to build in something around unions into the neural network because if you just use a function approximator approach, you have to be able to train it with all possible combinations of these. Oh, that's a good Otherwise, it's, it can't extrapolate, right? It can only interpolate what it's already seen. Um, so it's it, so yes, it can do, in theory, it can approximate any function, but you have to be able to- uh, You'd you have know, to be trained on those every- training it, but- You'd have to train a, a on lot every of combinations. Single, all the combinations yeah. of all possible unions, which kind of defeats the- Yeah, purpose. it's not gonna generalize the concept <laughs> of unions. It's yeah. not going to come to that generalization. That has that, to be built in somehow. That defeats the purpose of unions, right? The purpose of unions are represent uh, ambiguity that you haven't dealt with. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one one last was, point. It, that's, go on, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, so in the case where you're trying to do coordinate transformations, where you don't have to see all possible coordinate transformations, you just have to see sufficient examples along one axis. You know that that's when a function approximator, if it's low level enough, could actually achieve that. It doesn't have to see all combinations of all objects of all worlds to, to do that. So there, there could be a position in there at the lowest level to actually do something like that. I would think. Um, I mean, the higher levels remain unspecified, but if we're trying to translate back and forth across a single axis, uh, there's and there's something that is constantly being you're exposed to, which is movement, there might be just, you know, a finite amount of training that has to occur before you kind of got it down. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, who knows? I mean, the Thomas has to learn to do these things too. And it's a very simple learning. And so I guess if you, if you reduce the problem sufficiently to 1D, then the neural networks get pretty damn simple. Um, anyway, but I think it's a general philosophy that that uh, Hinton was taking as we're going to use you know classic neural networks for all these things, um, and we'll use them liberally and we'll leave that to the to the reader to decide exactly how that's going to be done. So, uh, Marcus, you, you mentioned it will a few times. Is that I, I there is no implementation? Uh, when you talk about the the, the models that it will do, that it will do something else. So. 
there is no actual implementation of this in Hinton's paper, or did someone else build an implementation of this? So what is the state of Glon today? No, it's not been implemented. It's it's all it's all imaginary. You we everyone who's run this has run it in their heads. Oh, okay. Not not even by like an other someone have tried to do that, you know, some other group or because this paper has been out there for a while. I don't know how long. A month. Month. Okay. <laughs> 30 days. <laughs> that wouldn't be, but that's not very much time to implement this thing. Oh, well, uh, I, guess I mean, of course, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be surprised if people within his group have been implementing it or trying to implement it. You could just uh, assume that's going on right now. I don't know. He makes the point. He makes the point very clearly that, you know, this is a purely thought paper. Um, you know, there's no attempt at all to make, to make this uh, uh, reality. You know, so I don't, I mean, he, he didn't say these things were underway. At least I didn't see it. Maybe it's in there. I don't know. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's the uh, it's the first sentence in the abstract. He he readily admits that this is not a working system. So, I think it, yeah, he just wants to get it out there to start a discussion. I mean, in some sense, we do that too, right? We publish papers where we haven't. Uh, some of them we have implemented, some of them we haven't. Um, or if we ha generally we have, but they're usually toy versions, if at least. Yeah, so, yeah, at least, yeah, yeah, even toy versions, but. But you know, as you all know, I mean, we like to think about these things purely abstract things. We could, we kind of know they're going to work before we implement them. <laughs> so, you know, so it's like it's not like, well, is this an idea? Well, if we can do it, it's like, yeah, we kind of think it through before, you know, at least a certain amount. Make sure it's capable of work. So I, I, don't, I don't, I don't hold that against him. Although it, it did seem, again, he didn't work through all the details. Yeah, me neither. I'm not like holding against anyone. I'm just curious if like those who try to implement what sort of challenges they face. So if I don't know, if someone knows any project in the web that tried to implement mm -hmm. that. That was more of my question. Uh, yeah, I just did a quick I did a quick Google search and I found some people who have already like implemented Glom. And then somebody is claiming to have some pretty good results. Um, yeah. Oh. I mean just uh, that was a very quick brief Google search. Well, okay, can you share that later with us? Yeah, I Please. can send it in the Slack. All right. Thanks. So the last point I wanted to make on this whole degrees of freedom thing is, um, so we usually think of these as location, orientation, and all those degrees of freedom. Or in entorhinal cortex, we think of head direction cells and grid cells and border cells, maybe a, a, a couple others. Uh, I, one way where Hinton takes this even further, where Glom takes this even further, is it blurs everything together, even object identity. Uh, everything is kind of conjunctively encoded, uh, though the network may choose to separate them. By default, it's, it's all kind of conjunctively encoded. So I call this out in a dedicated slide. One difference from our model that's kind of worth consideration, because it reminds me of a little bit of biology. Uh, so this uh, I'll, I'll read the top bullet and then I'll make my second point. Each unit in the GLOM population vector is free to conjunctively encode any mix of the degrees of freedom. So the location, the orientation, the identity, how the stapler, stapler openness, how open the stapler is. Uh, if GLOM were to encode this, like cells might, si might simultaneously code for all of these to some extent. And just the point I want to make is that um, the the literature on grid cells, head direction cells, all of that often kind of paints this cartoon world where everything is these separate populations. And the truth resembles this a little bit more than the cartoon version. I, I call out this one paper that makes the point that everything kind of exists on a continuum. And there are the many cells that are kind of mixes of, of all of these cells. Uh, and so I just, I, th this was worth calling out to me. In some ways, this actually is biologically plausible that it kind of blurs things together. Yeah, I, although, I mean, there's two ways you can look at that. Um, I mean, you know, it's interesting, like when you think about, oh, let's think of classic pure grid cells and classic pure head direction cells. And then as we think about how they're created uh, and we think about the, like the oscillatory interference models, you'll end up with these conjunctive cells that, don't, that are part of the creation of the pure grid cells and part of the creation of the pure orientation cells. Um, so you could say, oh, well, that's one way of explaining it. We actually are creating true grid cells and these conjunctive things are just the components that are 
that naturally occur when you use the methods of oscillatory interference to create them. Um, or you could say, no, they really aren't any pure anything and it's all a mixture. Uh, I'm, I'm a more of a former, it seems more structured and more believable and, and um, you know, but I see your point. Um, but again, I, I think it's too easy an excuse to say, oh, we don't need to worry about any of those details, you know, how grid cells come about because we'll just do this and they'll, something will be gritty and some things will be orientation and some things will be, and so on. Um, so I'm, I'm not convinced by this argument. I'm open to it, but I'm not convinced by it. Fair point. Uh, okay, this brings me to part five, my final part on movement. Um, and but and what I'll what I'll talk about here is that movement partially works because this has a location of the sensor representation, uh, but it doesn't have path integration built in. Uh, there is kind of an obvious extensibility point. So here I'm broadly going to make the statement that with GLOM movement is low hanging fruit, but it's not something they've focused on. Hmm. So what first I'll say like what partially works. Um, so here's uh, Jeff mentioned this figure a little bit earlier. Oh, well, um, actually, I was, I was talking about a different figure. But... Uh, the the other one. You're right. Uh, there, you're correct that there is another figure, and I guessed wrong. So um, here, time. Uh, uh, knowing this audience, uh, visually parsing this is going to be hard at first, but it's a pretty simple figure. It's just time is moving from bottom to top. We're looking at the same population of cells across time, and um, and this is showing that there is both bottom up input from level L minus one to L. And there's top down input from the above level to the lower level. It's, it's just a confusing image to see arrows pointing up saying top down, but that, but that's what this, just, just helping you parse this image visually a little bit. Uh, so it has this location of the sensor relative to a shared reference frame. Typically in the text here, that's just simply where on the on the retina the pixel is, uh, but but it really can generalize to anything. It could be it could be finger location relative to hand, example for um, et cetera, and um, and I, I even sneak this in like it could even be a different reference frame, and I'll bring that up in a future slide. Uh, but the point I want to make here is if you update this location as the as like a finger moves around predictions are going to change uh the 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 top down input is gonna is gonna cause this to predict its input you have to operate under one constraint uh prediction with movement will work as is if um the top level the highest of these levels the scene one is unchanged by the movement uh, if if your scene level so so for example if if um if your if this is a multi-sensor array with vision and touch and you move your hands around, I would say this kind of does support path. It does support movement in that sense. If, if it's all, if you're, if, if it's like vision and touch and grabbing things. But is, is movement helping in any sense? Or are you just saying, hey, if I move, I'll still be able to, you know, I'll be able to, the, the network will result, you know, end up with the same representation. I mean, is it is movement part is it assisting in the, the inference and learning, or is it? Just I would say, yeah, it's going to infer across time. It's it's gonna it's gonna be able to more quickly recognize that the things represent the things that are grasped. You're asking a valid question now. Uh, yeah. uh, I am. I let's see. I am putting. I'm showing that this almost works as okay, is, but it's not a focus of the paper. I, I would say it partially works. I mean, it, in some sense. It, if your if your sensor moves, the system doesn't like go berserk, you know. It kind of like, oh yeah, okay, I got it. But as you point out, there's no path integration, so there's no there's no knowledge at all about where your sensor is going to be after you move. It's more like it's like your eyes are doing random saccade, and uh, and nobody knew about it. No part of the brain knew it's where your eyes are moving. Um, it, it was yeah, still, I guess it, the the simple statement I'm making is if you just had an arrow pointed at this that says proprioception. It's yeah. going to kind of work. It's going to do some things useful. Yeah, I still, but I think it's missing the core crux of movement. As a, it's, know, it doesn't right? have path integration. And, uh, yeah, and without path integration, you don't really know where you're going to be. It'd be like be like walking around your house, and every time you open your eyes, you'd be in a new room, but you had no how you didn't know how you got to that room. You know, you just like you know, I don't. Know, I'm in the bathroom now. Oh, I'm in the kitchen now. <laughs> you know? um, as opposed to oh, I went down the hallway, and now I know I'm going to be. In, I can predict I'm going to be in the bathroom. You know, it's, it, you just, 
they just wouldn't know that. This would be like, open your eyes. Okay, I, I'm in my house again. I get it. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. To me, that's without the path integration, as you point out, it seems to be very, very impoverished in terms of a um, sensory motor system. Um, not, so not, it, maybe, maybe there's a way of doing it. I don't know. But so is that uh, because they're only working with static commutes? Uh, I'm guessing they're not working with the environment involves actions and all in that paper. Right, they, they didn't focus on this. He, he, he focused explicitly on taking static images and, and finding the whole part hierarchy of components in that image, but always with static images. But there is no, no mention at all of, you know, like some problem that involves actions, not even like a future work kind of preference. I don't know. I don't know if he mentioned it. No, the, this is the, the paper is explicit, explicitly about part whole hierarchies. Uh, in a single flash or a, a, a single, yeah. it, it, is that and with intentionally designing it so that it's going to also be capable of handling video? Yeah. Right. Well, we, we talked, so we share with that the idea of hard whole hierarchy, the whole idea that there's compositional structure and you're learning a model of the world where things are, you know, the relative poses of objects, you know, the displacement zone. Um, we focus on that too. We're doing it through movement and attending the one object at a time and building this up sequentially, which is clearly what brains do. Um, but he's trying to solve it in a flash, as, as Marcus said. I think part of this is the, the paper is 45 pages long and he decided not to include all of his thoughts. Uh, but Maybe, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting, it's a different approach. I mean, personally, I would never have written that paper. I would never said, I always felt that the flash inference problem is such a red herring it's going to lead you down the wrong paths of thought, and so I've always personally rejected that. Um, but but that, that doesn't mean that's right. I mean, it's alternate to try it the other way. So you know, we've struggled around. We've struggled not understanding how this stuff works, and we start off with simple things like sequence memory, which is a long way from understanding you know visual scenes. But at least you had that temporal component to it, and we relied on that. Where. I mean, he's starting from the other end, start with flash inference, which is what most vision researchers do, right? That's what vision research has been about for the last 50 years, primarily, is about flash inference. And, um, and he's saying, how can I get this part whole hierarchy thinking about it that way? In fact, he ends up voting is interesting, but you know, Subodai points out maybe, maybe all, he, Subodai is arguing, don't all classic neural networks vote, have regions of islands of voting? I don't know. Uh, so the, the, go on. Uh, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say on the islands of voting thing. I I just thought it would be interesting to um, make sure I understood that a bit better in terms of Jeff. You mentioned kind of uh, at least with um, kind of thousand brains that uh, generally everything's kind of voting on one thing at a time. Um, if if I understood that correctly, but then well, I was just wondering how. Can, how, how kind of uh, one could perceive multiple objects uh, in parallel, which I guess I, I, if I, yeah, is what you were maybe getting at, um, Mark, well, in terms of, kind of the advantage of. Do you actually perceive multiple objects in parallel? I mean, that's it, interesting it, it's an interesting, it's, it's an ongoing debate in the psychology literature. It, a lot of, yeah, research, um, I think in the kind of 80s onwards suggested that uh, a lot of things we, we only process in like a, a serial manner and then uh, very simple features we can process in a parallel manner. But I think if you look at the actual uh, plots for things like search times, it's more of a kind of a gray answer that obviously we process things better when we direct our attention to them. But it's also not as if there's no processing going on yeah. outside of attention. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh... But again, those things, if you think about like um, search time, you know, it's, you have to look very carefully at the experiments because some of these things are popping out, these pop out experiences, you know, well, it's a different color. Well, that doesn't mean you're processing multiple things at a time or, or a different shape or, um, you know, the, the real question is if I show you, you know, five objects on the screen and I flash in in front of you and those objects have no relationship to each other, do you process them simultaneously? Or do you, can you even recall all of them? You know, if I, if I, if I, if you don't have time to attend to them individually, can you actually be qualified? Um, I don't know. I would probably suspect not. <laughs> but, yeah, but I mean, generally it seems it, that people, people can 
do that to a degree. They definitely don't do it perfectly, but it's they definitely do better than chance. But even that, um, would be, even that would be the question is, is that somehow the brain buffering this up and, and surely processing one after another? I mean, clearly right. when I say the words, I, I can't say them all at once. I have to say them. But it almost right, seems right, like right. conceptually, when you're thinking about it, you'd say, okay, what was there? Okay, that was that one. What was over there? That was that one. What was over there? That was that one. It's not like you have like this apple bike car, you know, dog representation and they're all coming out at once. <laughs> anyway, I think it's it's an open question. And, as, and I was hesitant a little bit when I said to the attentional mechanism, it's only one thing at a time. Um, because I think at different levels of the cortical hierarchy, it, it gets more complicated and we don't understand it well. So I don't think we know the final yeah. answer to that question. No, You're right. you. It's probably a grayscale, the gray area. So the, I'm nearing the end of this, uh, but on the topic of path integration, one thing I do point out is the pose is already represented in here. It just needs to be updated. And so using movement update, move, using movement info to update a pose is a doable thing. I think like, that like, although movement is not built into this, I think it's probably intentionally kept, you know, close at hand. It's, it's it, at the moment, it's easy to add movement to this. Uh, and so it's, it's not but like that's, gone that, down a bad that, road. But that wouldn't be true as we, we were talking about the issue of unit, it's not gonna work very well for that, right? So, um, I don't think there's any issue there. Well, we, well, I don't know. I mean, Tsubutai brought up a good point, and I agree with him is that that you'd have to train on all those unions, and and uh, how would it, it just doesn't seem practical. Um, well, I think at the top level, you won't, you wouldn't have any union there. Is that right? Mm -hmm. You would just have a you, single you could interpretation. Have a, or early on, you could have uncertainty, but like while you're still doing inference, being able to path integrate those unions. Yeah, yeah that is a thing. But I don't. But th this is a different conversation because we already know how to do that with uh, mm -hmm. hand coded networks. The coordinate transformations is the thing we can't do with hand code, coded networks very well. Uh, but path integrating unions is a doable thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, one one thing I point out here is strictly you you wouldn't necessarily need all of these levels to path integrate. You could just have one of them do it, probably the top one, and the others could inherit it using. What if stuff. here's another thing that comes, you know, one of the things you get from having um, sort of reference frames for storing your knowledge in grid cells and so on is you get the ability to manipulate objects. So I could, you know, I could, I can see an object from one orientation, uh, tend to its different components, and I can now visualize it from a different orientation. No problem. Um, does anything like that, does this have any capabilities like that here? That's something this is explicitly enabling, or it's, it's, it's capsules, especially we're going straight for that, uh, by, you yeah. know, giving a network yeah. matrices. Yeah. Uh, but, and then this, one, this he, one wants that, uh, I guess it's an open question whether. The question, did he do it? Because he points out in this paper, the capsules could, he couldn't make them work. They just, you know, they're just too problematic. And, um, and so on the question, does, does that happen in this method, in the GOM method? Is there, um, I think that's what he's trying to do. Um, you know, no one's implemented it, so it's hard but to how, know. But how is it? I, I'm missing that. I mean, here, I, I, what I'm imagining he's doing here is saying, here's a scene, and I'm going to tell you what's in the scene. These are the different components in the scene, and this is how they go together in the scene. But where is the structure that allows me to rotate the entire scene and now know where everything's going to be? How does that, how's that in here? Where is that in here? I'm not saying it isn't, it's, I just, it's not obvious to me. It's a good question. I actually had the same question for the recent capsule paper. I, I, I wish I knew the answer to this. I don't know right now. I, I don't know I mean, how it gets that. It just seems like without a reference frame, it's almost impossible to do that. I mean, you can always try to lower in everything, but that doesn't, you know, that just gets impractical. So it just, I don't know, I don't, I've kind of like, con I'm not sure I convinced myself, but I'm working on the assumption that, that there's no other way to do that without reference frames? How do I stretch something in one dimension? How do I rotate it mentally? How do I, uh, in, into positions I've never seen before? Um, and, um, and so I'm having trouble seeing how you do that here. So uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to chime in here. Um, so in some of his earlier capsules work, um, I think he mentioned that um, you know, specific capsules were designated for to recognize certain parts. And then there were higher level capsules to re recognize certain holes. And in that, 
when you when you have it like that, you know what the relationship is between the part and the whole. So the so the transformation um, between the part and the whole can be encoded into the weights. But in this case, when he has universal capsules, I think there was a section um, in the paper, Marcus, where he talked about how um, this time, you know, you can't encode uh, the transformation between lower level capsules and higher level, higher level ones because um, you're always going to have different parts that are being recognized. So instead, there has to be in, in that in that distributed represent that embedding vector, it has to have some uh, bits that are also allocated to um, the the transformation to get from the lower level capsule to the higher level one. That has to be in there along with the representation of the identity of the part. So I think that's that's where he, that's how he claims to encode that information. Yeah, I guess the one question there following on from that is sort of mechanistically, how does that happen if you if you if you're trained to recognize a particular object at a certain pose and now you see a completely novel view of that at a different pose, will you automatically be able to recognize that object and recover the pose? Right. It, that's that's you know, capsules really tried to do that explicitly. And it's I guess the question is how does that happen here, right? Yeah, I mean, in some sense- How does that to, level of generalization happen? To, to do that, you have to represent the three-dimensional pose of objects relative to each other. And, and when I read this paper, all I kept thinking, this is an image, and he's trying to get the two-dimensional uh, position of objects relative to one another. Um, but that's, that's not what you need to rotate something, you know? Um, because their, their two-dimensional relationships will change completely as you rotate in 3D. And so the, the, the object composition has to be a three-dimensional structure. Um, and, and I didn't see that here. We didn't talk about training. And I know that a big part of how capsules work is you know, the, how they augment the image and they train it to predict uh, its rotations, et cetera. So how, how does it work? And can't you learn that through training? So the training didn't mention, I don't think the, the paper mentioned anything about training on different viewpoints on the object. So I'm at a loss for how that gets, how that part is gonna get into this. I just haven't looked into that. Well, and I had the same question well, for the stacked capsule autoencoders paper. Uh, sorry if you hear noise. What are you gonna say? Yeah, so, so, yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, the, the hope would be that you would not need to train on different poses, right? You would only treat, if it's a particular, if it's, let's say, assume it's a rigid object, you train on one pose, and now, or small number of poses, and now you can recognize it in, in very different poses. And the thing that Karan was mentioning, at least in the original capsules, I think the idea was that the re relative locations of everything is encoded in the weights. And so you, you don't, you, all you need to do is recover their relative location. You don't, you know, at a different orientation or a different scale, you would automatically be able to recognize that same, same object, but it's not clear how that happens here. But to with that here in the, I think the, the argument is here that information that's encoded in the weights in the in the in the in the previous capsules work is now encoded uh, as part of the embeddings, so that's used to go from like the capsule at level L, the part at level L, mm -hmm. to the whole at level L plus one. I think that that's the argument. What well, what do you mean when you say it's represented in the embeddings? I mean it has to be learned, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because I, that's I, the I, question. I <laughs> yeah. And again, if you, if you see an object at a specific pose at some point, yes, it's maybe the pose is in the embeddings now, but now you see that same object in a completely novel pose. Um, that's, you know, how does it recognize that it's the same object at a different pose? This is a gap in my knowledge. I don't have an answer to this. Now, yeah. I would say that the capsules went through this transition where the first paper did all this explicitly. It was a train to yes. do this. And then the later one that apparent, I think the the one that performed the best, the stacked capsules auto autoencoders paper, got away from this. And I I never really wrapped my head around how that satisfied the original goals of capsules. Uh, but maybe it did. I didn't do my homework on this. So so I'm I'm also lost. You've raised a good question here. And I think the reason this is coming up now is because when the system's processing movement, it has to solve the same problem uh, as to solve yeah. this. And that, that's why we're talking about this right now. And that's where movement comes into this. Um, and so, I don't know, in some ways, maybe our con a contribution or a point we could make here is that like that problem gets solved once you bring movement into it. So punting on movement might not actually benefit you right now. It actually might solve this training problem. Uh, 
Okay, I'll come to an end pretty quickly here. Um, I mentioned I mentioned here like strictly you would only need to path integrate one level and you could inherit it from the rest. Or if you have path integration at, 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 on every level, it will improve sensory motor inference. Uh, final slide here, I'll just go by quickly and say, you could also rearrange these and put the arrow elsewhere. It's not worth me going deep into this, but if anyone wants to look at the YouTube video and make see my point here, if you if you had a reference frame transformation where the scene is now in like its external reference frame, where if, if you, as you move through the scene, the scene level vector doesn't change, if it's actually like allocentric, um, then path integration would happen in this box, and and th this would be like a nice unifying theory where moving moving always updates this box. I don't expect all of you to follow that right now. We're we're going long, so I'll just go to my summary slide unless someone else wants to interrupt me here. Uh, so summary, uh, I would say that the current thousand brains theory models and GLOM use essentially the same building blocks, or at least a lot of the same building blocks. The voting part to whole reference frame transformations and newly like neural representations that can handle uncertainty or amb ambiguity. Uh, I'd say we prescribe a lot more of the intermediate populations. Like we say that we're, there's going to be this location for each sensor. There's going to be displacement cells. Um, and while GLOM just kind of lets a vector of cells learn whatever it wants, it may learn these, it may not. It may find a different way of doing it. Uh, we emphasize movement. Uh, GLOM doesn't, but it's. It, I still see it as kind of low-hanging fruit, and it maybe it'd be worth them focusing on it now for the training reasons we talked about. Uh, and then GLOM emphasizes multi-level part whole hierarchies and islands of agreement. Okay, this is at the end of everything I was gonna say. Well, I would say, I mean, we also emphasize the tie to neuroscience <laughs> and explaining For sure. yeah. how the brain works. Yeah, and that's not covered at all in GLOM. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you're right, but I, I, I'm not convinced about movements of low hanging fruit, I think sort of an impoverished version of movement might be, but going back to that, you know, the rotating of an object in 3D is, is part of movement in my mind. It's not clear how you do that at all here, but, but I think it's interesting, you know, I think it is interesting here as an AI researcher, basically trying to solve the same problems that we're trying to solve, which I think is great. Um, Cause so many people in the, in the machine learning world don't concern themselves with some of these issues. So I think it's encouraging. Uh, Marcus, I have more of a high level question. So from your uh, reading and studying this paper, is there any particular insight that change your mind about, you know, the way you think about machine learning, about the brain? Is there any particular insight that was really uh, helpful for you? Hmm. I'm almost too tired to give a good answer to this question. Uh, <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question. That's, that's a funny uh, answer. So, um, I, really, what what just happened is I I worked I worked to prepare this presentation, and I'm going to sit with it for a little while after this. And that's my that is my real answer is I haven't sat with it for for some time. Um, yeah, I, I guess just one. I do think that Hinton is definitely coming in with a um, with a strong psychology background and has done many experiments just trying to, to interrogate what the visual system is doing from like an experimental outsider standpoint. But yeah, that, so I do think that he is absolutely trying to solve that problem. But how he how he lands it on the cortical columns and such is less less um less guaranteed to be right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, that was great. Well, thank you for preparing that, Marcus. It was really very yeah, helpful. Thank you. I'm surprised you didn't show that other diagram. I thought that was one of the, the, the one that goes time goes from left to right with the, the three levels. So. I mean, okay, you people, yeah. you could, people can look it up themselves if they want. But anyway, no, really good job. So thank you. <laughs>